Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm so excited today. We are going to talk about trees. I have Jane Warren Campbell, uh, the writer of a beautiful book called Conversations with a Tree. And we want, I wanted to, to talk to her. She reached out to me because I've been having these experiences where I keep on feeling like I'm talking to the plants and the trees and having this connection to the earth. And and Jane had written a whole book about this and has a unique experience. And so I was very excited to talk to her and add this knowledge and understanding of the trees and everything else to the Reality Revolution. Thank you so much for coming on. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for having me on the show, Brian. I'm so excited and so great that you also have this connection with the trees. It's perfect. Well, yeah. And it's hard to put into words. Uh, and a lot of times there's a little bit of doubt uh, when you're dealing with this situation. So I was excited to talk to you. So for everybody that doesn't know your story, tell us a little bit more about your story and how you got involved in having a conversation with a tree. Sure. Yeah. Well, it started actually in the year 2012, which was a pivotal year for all of us. Yeah. And for me, it started very early on. I, instead of having a New Year's resolution, I dedicated the year to healing. And mm -hmm. it started a whole series of events that had me moving from the city where I lived into a small town. And I had actually attended university at that town for one year. It was Wolfville, Nova Scotia. So I grew up on the east coast of Canada. Mm -hmm. And I ended up moving there in June. And found this trail that you could hardly even see from the street because it was completely wooded and there was this little trail going in. Mm -hmm. And I found this trail one day and it was a beautiful spot. You're walking by a stream and you're totally immersed in the trees and you follow along and there's a little pond mm -hmm. and then you cross a bridge at the pond and the trail divides and there's this tree in the middle of the trail where it divides. Right. And it's a perfect spot to just sit and take in the environment and enjoy and one day I was sitting there and I just knew beyond any doubt that this tree was asking me to be her scribe. And oh, for wow. me, I am a channel. I've been, I've been channeling for many years at that point. Mm -hmm. And I was actually collecting channelings from the Council of Nine when this happened to write another book. So I think that's possibly why I was so open to hearing this from a tree because it right. never occurred to me to ask a tree for information. I've always loved trees. But, right. Um, so she asked me to buy a journal so I could share her messages with the world. So I knew she wanted me to write a book. And I went out the very next day, bought a beautiful journal and started coming back. And it just turned into a beautiful relationship with this tree. And it's a magnificent uh, book that some of the stuff the tree talks to you about yeah. really resonated with me in a lot of ways. It's quite profound, isn't it? What the yes. tree can share with us. Right. And basically their message. So this tree called herself Henrietta after a young woman who used to sit at her base a hundred years ago, she said, lamenting lost loves. And this young woman's name was Henrietta. So uh -huh. she asked me to call her Henrietta. Oh, cool. And um, yeah, the wisdom that she shared and the experiences I've had from her, she felt very much like the guides because I felt unconditional love from her the same way I do from the guides. When right. I'm channeling, often I'll be moved to tears just feeling their love. Right. And I remember one time I was sitting with Henrietta and I got up to walk away. And as I was walking away, I just thanked her and she sent so much love to me that I was moved to tears as I was walking. Wow. The experiences can be quite profound. So this is something that came to me when I started hearing the trees. And it kind of blew my mind because, of course, my whole life, trees are just trees. They're inanimate. They don't have any life in, in my mind. And, I, and, I, and I, so I tried to really put myself in, in the plant's consciousness and understand. After watching some time lapse, I realized that they're experiencing time differently. Mm. Like they see us, it's just going, when we watch that plant in a time lapse, it's moving up and for them, that's just normal time. But, but for us, we see this slow. So they see us and it's as if we're seeing, they're looking at things moving around fast and it's, eh, they're just blurs to us. We're in our own time. I, I kind of got this. So, and I, and I, and, and the trees kind of pointed out, it seems like the trees are maybe tiny, little more advanced 
than the others. And they're aware of this temporal difference and they know everything. They do. Connected to all of, not just their own breed of trees, but they're connected to all of the trees. And, yeah. and they're aware of all the waves of energy around them. But yeah. most of the time we're not aware of this communication because it's just, they're on a different temporal level. Is, am I getting, is that correct? Yeah, that's not something that ever came to me, but it makes perfect sense. Okay, yeah. Because you know, like, time-lapse photography will show a vine growing very quickly. You know? Right. So that makes total sense. And I know that the trees are totally aware of us as we walk by. Mm -hmm. and, and, and their awareness, like you mentioned, that they have this knowing. This I asked knowing. me at a one time, like, how can you know so much? Because the messages that have come through are, are mm -hmm. like, profound. And she said, we pull our information from the all that is, from the quantum field, okay. where the all intelligence lies. And it was really interesting because after that, I was watching an interview that Greg Braden did in Italy. Mm -hmm. And he was with scientists who were actually researching that perhaps our brain, perhaps our memory is not stored in our brain, but that the brain is an antenna that pulls information from the field. Right. And they've actually done research where in lab rats, they would teach them to walk a maze, and then they would take sections of the brain out, and it didn't matter how much of the brain they removed, their lab rats would still remember how to do this. And so science is really starting to show that this probably yes. it's true that our, we are pulling memory from the field and it's not actually stored in the brain. So when Henrietta told me that, it just makes perfect sense. It makes sense. Catching up with that. Right. So they, they also said, you know, they're not distracted by movement. You talk about their stillness. Their stillness is part of why they are just in awareness. And I think that's the big difference with trees is that they actually hold this awareness she could say because in the conversations they're very aware she called it our plight as humans being so lost and and our technology pulling us away mm -hmm. and they're aware of this and they want to pull us back right and love to us just like you've sensed with the trees that you've connected with and they're right. reaching out to you I, I don't doubt that that's because they knew that you would intuit and mm -hmm. that you would allow yourself to connect with them and receive that message and then begin that communication. Right. Yeah. When I look at a tree or even a plant, I, I, it's just a reaching towards source. It, 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 I see it differently than the, 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 ge the geometry of the tree mm. looks differently now. Oh. It's, a, it, it's this beautiful, still aware, reaching towards source with, with no fear. As you say in the book, uh, if somebody's gonna come and cut me down, then I know I'm gonna provide a new source. And, and, and a new um, opportunity to contribute. They don't run away. That's They're right. in this still moment awareness that it really you captured uh, in the book. Yeah, and they're rooted into the earth at the same time. Right. Beauty, like they're really teaching us, you know, stay on this earth, get rooted in. Right. Be anchored on the earth and also reaching up to the divine in a sense. Exactly, they're, they may be more advanced than we are. Uh, we I, think that we... I believe so. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and and then I connected with another tree who called himself Georges en Francais. Oh yeah. And he was masculine, Henrietta feminine. So right. You have genders, and they do have genders. More of a personality. Uh -huh. But he said something to me once that just blew my mind because I think few humans even know that. This. Right. He said, "I know I am not tree." I'm particles come together to represent tree so that humans can have the experience of tree, but I am not tree. I am oh, particles wow. come together to represent this. He was talking about quantum physics. Right. And that's why they're, they don't mind being cut down. They know that they're not actually this thing anyway. They're much more than that. Yeah. And so it's such a profound um, experience of knowing that they have. Yeah. I was, I'm pulled to, uh, if you ever remember Seth, uh, yes. yeah, Seth says that some advanced entities 
will become trees just like a spa. It's like going to the spa, like they just hanging out at the spa. It's a relaxing time for them. And so like we, you know, we, we go to Hawaii to the resort for a week to relax and, the, and, and have fun. They go and become a tree for several hundred years. And, and that's just their idea of relaxing. <laughs> that makes perfect sense, right? You've got nothing to do but just be there. Right. You're just going to be a part of source in that eternal bliss, all knowing in the quantum field. Mm -hmm. um, if wouldn't it be amazing if suddenly we awoke to this connection? Mm -hmm. uh, it would mm -hmm. really change everything yeah. uh, because we 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 treat it like we dominate the plants and the trees, right. and we are disconnected to the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this this disconnection is is a serious problem with what's going on in the world. It's true, and the trees have told me, you know, us humans have an emptiness. And we don't know why we're so empty. Right. We seek fulfillment from things or alcohol or lust. And they mm -hmm. said, you're empty because you're disconnected from nature. If you bring yourself into nature more often, you are going to feel more fulfilled and your life will be more full. So right. So right about this, you know, us having moved away from nature so much, I really feel this is one thing about what we're going through right now is that yes. people have had time away from the busyness of their lives and the opportunity for nature to come in the foreground again, instead of just being lost behind all the busyness of our lives and people are starting to connect again. Right? It's true. Mm -hmm. First thing I do, I go and we're, let's get that garden going again, grab some seeds, you know, and, and then I feel connected to all the plants. I, I, I can feel their emotions. Now, have you communicated with anything other than trees? I have actually. Okay. Um, that's why I call myself a nature communicator. And this was right. so much fun, Brian. I have a friend who's a yoga instructor. Uh -huh. And when COVID hit, she started doing her yoga online. Right. And so she set up her space and she has a corn plant, which is one of those plants with the tall stalks and then just leaves right. at the top. And it was in behind her. And one day she was saying, oh, why don't you just connect with my corn plant? And she had sent me a picture of how it looks when she's doing her online videos and the corn plant was in the back. I connected with this plant. It was so happy to be on TV is how the plant <laughs> described it to me. Like this plant loved being the center of attention when she was doing these classes to be included in that experience and it was just overjoyed and then two days later this plant started to bloom she'd had this plant for years and it had never bloomed and it got the bloom almost looks like a corn stalk and it grew like in two or three days eight inches long oh wow and little buds were coming out amazing yeah and when i connected in with it it was just so delighted and she did some research after about them blooming and and whoever she found said they're blooming either because they're very happy or they're about to die and oh wow very happy and it <laughs> yeah so it's so much fun i the other day we got a beautiful flower plant it, it, it was we brought it home and it was kind of out in the sun and like the next day it was it was overly like all like down from the, like it was a and but i got this feeling like it was just a little kid kind of like being dramatic oh, <laughs> right you, and so I, I moved it i moved it to the shade and i started talking to it and i remember the wind was coming but it was moving and it wasn't moving with the wind i could feel i could see it kind of um because it almost started blossoming immediately like with it within 20 minutes yeah. It was all back to normal. And I was like, you're being pretty dramatic, aren't you? Do you prefer it right here in the shade? And it shook. And I was like, okay, I don't know. Maybe I'm hearing but that. And then I brought my girlfriend over and I said, okay, I want you to notice the wind. Do you yeah. notice the plant? And, and she didn't believe me, but I can feel it. Now, now, right. now what you're saying, maybe, maybe they are moving at some point. I don't know, but. Well, it sounds like you're very receptive and well i'm open to it like, for sure you know you can <laughs> feel the vibration even if others wouldn't see it as something moving but you're so sensitive that you're maybe that. yeah so yeah. what is the what is the message that you would say that the tree that that you're talking to really wants us to get out there we can use this podcast to get that message out there the uh, message is really all about love it's about us coming home to ourselves and returning to nature to do that. 
That's mm. the message overall. Almost all the messages, especially from Henrietta, were about love. Okay. And and you know, there's scientific research to back up the benefits of being in nature. 30 minutes in nature can reduce your stress levels, reduce your blood pressure, increase the cells that prevent cancer for three mm -hmm. days. People that spend three days in the woods, they found it can have a 30 day effect of people healthier and reducing that stress. Right. And so this return to nature through nature brings us back home to ourselves. It's like all the stress of our lives simply disappears and we can come back home to ourselves because we are animals. We do have to live in homes. So we live differently than most animals, but it is coming back to knowing that our connection to nature really is important for our well-being, And that's one of the biggest messages. And for people to know I've, when I go visit a tree, I lean against the trunk and I also put the back of my head against the trunk. Okay. And for me, my heart will just start racing because the trees are clearing our energy for us. So they're also very healing and they can help us in this return. So one time it was so powerful that I was hyperventilating. Just my heart was racing so fast to be able to sit with it. And I said, like, what the heck's going on? And this tree said to me that I was living near a power line at the time, and the tree was clearing that energy for oh, me. Oh, wow. Yeah. I and found myself going up to and putting my heart on the tree. Oh, You're saying, cool. Deline, is that, is that okay, too? Yeah, either one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel um, a shift in your body when you do that? I feel like I'm, the, I can feel the source of the tree coming up, and I feel like I'm a part of it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm connected, the strength and the trunk of the tree. Now I have a tree that has, uh, it's dying. I've had somebody come and look at it and it's got some fungus. Uh, but when I, when I talk to it, it's fine. It's, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, um, yeah. um, it's an avocado tree and, 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 and uh -huh. it doesn't seem to be stressed out. Right. Um, I'm, you know, that like it, everything's okay. No worries. <laughs> I'm a tree moving on. going to be something yeah. else pretty soon. Right. I just worked with a client because I, I did, she had a tree that she had to cut down right. and she had learned about my work and asked me to check in. And this tree, um, it actually, the trunk came up and then divided very quickly mm -hmm. and it was kind of creating an energy portal. And this tree, she got me to connect in with it after it was cut down as well. And it knew that it was um, creating some disharmony for her because the energy was too much for her and she's only had this house for a couple of years and this tree knew that it was best for her that it be cut down and they're always accepting of everything but it knew that it was it was giving itself in a sense so that she could have a better experience living there and she yeah. kept some of the stumps from this tree and it was very happy that she did that because for a while those stumps are going to hold that energy so this tree can still contribute to the stillness that she's now experiencing in her backyard from wow. that tree being cut down. Yeah, yeah. So it just changes for you, I'm sure, everything, because when you leave the house, all the trees become these masters that you're walking among. Right. And so it, just going for a walk just down the road probably for you is a completely different experience. Well, I'll share a story. I'm really a country <laughs> girl, as you can imagine, instead right. of a city person. Right. And I was going to Toronto one time to do a workshop. And some people that I didn't know very well offered for me to stay at their home, which was very generous. And every day I would go for a walk, and I was really thrilled that it was a really beautiful part of Toronto. It's a big city, but this was a neighborhood, and everybody had flowers planted and it was June and everything was blooming and so I would go out for a walk every day just around this neighborhood and I was just so grateful that I was in the city but it was so beautiful and I was saying hello to all the trees and the flowers and I was moved to tears and I, I just wasn't quite sure what that was and so the second time this happened when I was moved to tears I said okay like what's going on I feel fine why am I moved to tears mm -hmm. and the trees immediately said to me you are giving us so much love. We are so grateful for you coming here and appreciating us that we are sending our love back to you. And those tears are feeling our unconditional love. Wow. So 
just know that when you're out walking, even in your own neighborhood or in a park, and you send love to the trees, they send so much love back to you. Whether you feel it or not, you can trust that it's happening. They do have a deep connection with humanity, and they're kind of waiting for us to come back to realizing that because they truly love supporting us with their energy and their love. And the sense I get from them is at one time, of course, on this earth, we had a deep appreciation. Right. And we have a symbiotic relationship. We all know about the carbon dioxide exchange between trees and human beings. Right. And, and it's much more than that. It's really an energetic exchange as well. And they really, you know, are here to offer that to us and waiting for us to come back. They're so excited. Like... I've had people read my book and then, you know, suddenly they don't see trees the same and they go out and, and start connecting with them. And, and they've told me how beautiful it feels for them. And the trees have told me like how much they appreciate that to have people to connect with again. Imagine the, um, the, the idea for them that all this thousands of years, they've been watching us, but we don't have any idea. And now we're on the cusp of a moment where we might actually make a psychic connection That's right. to these trees. And I, of course, there's people watching this right now that think that's completely insane. I yeah. get that. I understand that. Yeah. Uh, it's a personal experience that you must judge for yourself. Right. But for me, it's a feeling. When you reached out to me, I was almost immediate because I've been having this right. communication yeah, so and experience with the trees yeah. uh, and trying to put it maybe into a podcast episode without, um, you know, there's no scientific evidence. It's all just a personal individual experience of this, but there's definitely this connection that's growing with nature. Uh, it, are they, are they a single whole or, or uh, you're saying they're individualized. The right. trees are individualized and individualized personalities, not, not as one or anything like that. Right. Right. They are individual personalities. I also want to touch on a little piece of the science. But sure. yes, they are. Like um, this book started with Henrietta and then I was on a trail and this other tree connected with me. Right. And like I said, he had, Henrietta is so much love, but, but kind of still like not this vivacious personality. And then George was just so alive. And I said, <laughs> how can a tree have such a personality? And he said to me, Particles that come together, so particles, I think is what they're called in the right. quantum field, remember what they've been before. So when they come together to create something new, there is part of a memory of what it's been before, just like our DNA holds memory of genetics, right? Right, right. And so this creates personalities in the trees. Oh. And so they do seem very individual to me now their species will support each other science is showing that and right you know deliver uh, nutrients to other trees of the same species around them and that kind of thing just right like we help our neighbor or help our family right but I do see them as individual but one thing i wanted to point out about the science because when i was writing this book i i knew people are going to think she's crazy talking right. about trees. And so I wanted to find some research and right. synchronistically, of course, when you're looking, it comes to you. Exactly. And um, I found this documentary, The Hidden Life of Trees with Cleve Baxter, who used to do, he used to work for the CIA um, doing lie detector tests. Mm -hmm. And one day he just had the thought to connect his machine to a plant in his office and to see if there would be any response in his plant. And he had the, the thought to go get a match and burn the plant. And the moment he had the thought, the plant went off the charts on the lie detector. I forget the name of that machine. Wow. And so he started doing these experiments because he realized the plant was responding to his thought. Then he set up random experience, uh, experiments. So one time he hooked up this plant he rigged it up so he had a, a little bowl of shrimp sitting on top of boiling water and he rigged it up so that at a random time the shrimp would be dipped into this water. He left his office so that his thoughts wouldn't be influencing the outcome, went for mm -hmm. a walk, came back and saw that the plants 
had reacted on his chart at the same moment that the shrimp had been dropped into the water. The plants were responding to the death of the shrimp. Amazing. Other science has shown that plants have memory. I forget the name of the woman who did this experiment. They wouldn't publish, they were going to publish her um, peer-reviewed article, except that she wouldn't take the word memory out of it. So she had a mimosa plant, and that's the ones where the leaves are all little pieces and they'll close up. If right, right. Want. And she dropped them, I think, five feet out a window onto a, window onto a piece of foam. So the plants weren't harmed in the process. Right. And after three or four times of dropping them, they stopped responding. They stopped closing up their leaves because they realized they weren't going to be harmed. And then just to make sure that they weren't fatigued, and that's why they were no longer responding, she tried a different, different stimulus, and then they closed up again. And so it showed that they remembered. And yeah. then I think it was five months later, she would drop these plants and they would not respond because they remembered that they were safe. They were going to land on the foam. Oh, wow. So there's a lot of science coming out about plants and um, a lot that we've not known. And a lot of it's been taken away from us, I think, from ridicule and um, science, you know, right. not being able to find the answers. So. so should we feel guilty when we eat plants? No, because, you know, the plants <laughs> that we eat are going to die in the winter anyway, right? Right, right, <laughs> a right. A lot of them, or depending on your climate, but yeah. And okay. as we know from the trees, when you cut a tree down, they say, well, now I'm going to be firewood for someone, you know, right. they know, like they're just having a different experience now. Right. Well, life feeds on life. It's now an obvious thing, right? So. Right. And they can even teach us something about death. You know, we're coming to know that death is just a transition, just like birth is a right. transition into this world. Death is just another transition into something else. And the trees are really showing us that, you know, that there's nothing to fear. And um, there's awesome. an extraordinary science fiction book, series of books by Kevin Anderson. And he theorizes in the future, uh, super advanced, we can communicate um, over long distances, light years, with advanced superstellar ships, the people that are able to communicate are, they have plants. They have plants that are shared from the same planet. And so when they have to send a message, because if they sent one by radio or light, it would take hundreds of years. But when they go to the plant and they, and they communicate with the plant, the plant sends the message. And it feels, it felt so like there's something about this that feels like it's real. It's not just somebody fictionalizing in his mind. Like we could instantaneously, if we get a connection with plants, send messages to each other. I am so feeling that, Brian. Doesn't that sound like you? So we have a development on Mars. And maybe if, us, if we send a message, it might take a long time. But maybe if somebody brings a plant, we can connect to the plant, somebody that's intuitive enough. Yes. and trained in it enough it could be an, an entire advanced course at nasa on how to use plants i feel that too it feels like it's they're there for a reason beyond it and it could become something special that's something i've always thought of it always comes to me <laughs> oh so intriguing and yeah i just got a full body shudder on that one yeah just affirming that <laughs> so are you aware of people um they have machines that they've been able to turn the vibration of the plant into music so it's I have I've seen some of that too and that is amazing yes wouldn't it be interesting if they did that on Mars so they had a plant here right if the music would be the same as the plant on Mars if we were connecting those plants right and them to tune into each other you know that we could right do it. and they could they could test and experiment different plant species and trees they could join one together and then separate it so that they have a link maybe right. an even entangled link if some physicists tried to figure out why. Right. Uh, and then I, I, I really believe it may be take hundreds of years for people to look back and say, it's not the tech that will give us the ability to communicate. It's the trees. <laughs> so fascinating. Something alive. It makes sense. Really. Right. Yeah. Now we got to talk. Everybody watching heard you mention the council of nine. Oh, okay. And of course I have episodes on the council. Tell me more about your interactions with the council of nine. Well, this year, 2012, again, as I said, was so pivotal. And um, mm -hmm. after I had moved to this little town of Wolfville, I was meditating every day. And they came to me one day in a meditation and asked me to be their scribe. 
So I have no doubt I've been a scribe in past lives. Oh, wow. And so I said, I didn't know who they were at the time. So I said, okay, let me check it out and I'll get back to you. So I did some research on the Council of Nine and found right. very benevolent beings. And so that led to my book, The Spiritual Seeker's Guide to Happiness. So every day I would sit down okay. and get what I call an essay. So three or four pages. And I put that together as a collection. And here's something about this story that's very interesting. So I'd been doing this for a while. And then at one point I thought, well, I wonder how many essays I should have to finish the book. And the hundred, hundred popped into my head. I thought, okay, that seems like a good number. And then I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if I did one essay from this day on, if 100 would land on December 21st, because that was the day of the end of the Mayan calendar in 20. Right. So the next morning I got up, I counted how many I had so far, because at that point I wasn't doing it every day. It was, you know, I might miss a couple of days and then do it. So I counted how many I had so far. And then if I were to do one a day, sure enough, December 21st was 100 essays. Wow. And so I did collect, I didn't put all 100 in the book because um, a few of them were more personal for me, but it's 350 pages of messages from the Council of Nine, again, all about love like they really realize we've been deeply wounded we know that as humans. yes and in order for us to ascend we need to clear those wounds we're not going to lift off if we're carrying the weight of those wounds that that are have impacted all of humanity and so these are very loving messages and there's a woman who follows my work she's had this book for years and she keeps writing to me and saying these messages are so profound. And even now when I open them, they're somewhat timeless. And the way they address what we're going through right now, like mm -hmm. we're talking about change and things falling apart. So it's um, beautiful messages that you can also use, like just open it to a page and say, okay, what do you want wow. me to say? And, and you'll get a beautiful message from that. And I also offer love notes now. I'm offering them for free in my mailing list, which are... I create a meme and then every day I channel either the Council of Nine or the Elohim and put a message with the meme. And so right now, if you sign up to my newsletter list, you you get that in your inbox five days a week. I and love it. Telling me those two, like it just feels like every day it's talking to them because they yeah. know who they're talking to when they bring this through. So it's the history with the Council of Nine is very fascinating, I'm sure, as you found. It's been discussed uh in in a lot of different material the law of one uh i think that yuri somebody wrote uh a book about yuri geller and he was starting to channel and then there's a book called downloads from the nine i've noticed a sort of similar uh they speak similarly in all of these channelings mm -hmm. um but the history of it and it's so it's fascinating i've been mentioning it on my um they don't they don't necessarily rule over us they're just trying to help us right yeah. yeah i find the high guides don't want to rule over us at all like even when i'm doing work and people say well just let me know what they want to bring through they'll bring through a short message but they want you to be guiding where this session is going to go right they want to step in and bring through. they don't want to take away our free will or anything but they are in service to others and they are concerned about the earth and right. the and the darkness and and the way it is, I got that vibe from all of their, from all of their channeling. So I can't wait to read that. They're so. here to help us become sovereign within ourselves again, and know that we can get to the point where we don't have to worry about the darkness. Mm -hmm. We know that we are so much light that the darkness is just foolishness. Even in in conversations with a the tree, they said that like when you realize who you are, you'll you'll laugh that you ever had any fear of the darkness because you are so <laughs> right. much. So, yeah. okay, you mentioned you, you, that you channeled the Elohim, and there's a whole beautiful, wonderful, fascinating literary metaphysical history about the Elohim, so tell me about that. Well, you know, Brian, it's interesting for me because I, I'm not a curious person. Right. I've come just to be love and bring through love. I don't even get inquisitive about the history of all this. Really. That's probably why they choose you, <laughs> right? Yeah, and I just say I'm going to bring them through. Now, um, I've, I've been really called to um, work lately about Mary Magdalene. 
Oh. So I'm actually reading a book by Lars Mule called the old, the old Manuscript. It's a trilogy. And the middle one is Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is the Grail. And I just learned in the Grail that to call in the Elohim is calling in the vowel sounds. That And I received an Ascended Master's reading in the year 2000 mm -hmm. that asked me to start toning. And this reading was so profound. It said if I did everything that they said, I would be manifesting with the sound of my voice. I didn't follow through for years doing everything that they said. But for right. two years, I probably missed only seven days of toning and sounding. Right. And now I learned that we call in the Elohim through sound. I didn't even know that connection. Right. So that um, is, of course, talked about in magic. A lot of people are not aware of it. And a lot of the Elohim sounds are very simple and basic, not very hard to do. To do. They have a meditational feeling and aura about them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> and they again are here you know they they were part of creating humanity they, mm -hmm. they they are here to support us in this ascension and they've been watching us for a long time get to this point you know back to zero point and then oops we didn't quite and make come back it. up again and then oh, back down and then this time it's victorious yay <laughs> right so they've been here really supporting us that's um that's fascinating and what an honor now uh Talk about channeling a little bit. Tell me a little bit more. Uh, a lot of people will have questions about how to channel and how to distinguish that voice so that it's not your voice. So that, uh, I have this belief that as we move forward into this new age, more and more people are going to find that channeling is a way of accessing the quantum field. And there, it's going to be more and more common. And, and so I think that the, the lessons of channeling are important. So tell me a little more about your experience. If someone wants to channel a tree or, or an entity, uh, a lot of people are concerned that negative entities get involved. Right. Um, so tell me your, give a, a summary course for us to help us to channel. Yeah. One thing I think that's really important to know, I think a lot of people who, who have a natural ability to channel are claircognizant, which means that you just know. So as okay. opposed to clairvoyant, where you close your eyes and you see something, or clairaudient, you hear something, claircognizant, it's very hard to discern, is this just me making this up, or is this a knowing that's coming from another source? Mm -hmm. And what I say to people, it took me years to really trust my channeling was authentic. I didn't ever want to leave right. anyone astray. And actually, it was... It was in the late 90s when I first started channeling, but it was in 2010 when I decided to write a book. And I right. asked people to send me questions and I channeled the answers. And then I sent the questions back and asked if I could put them in my book. And because there were so many people coming back to me and saying, this is amazing. This felt so right on. I felt like you gave me a healing. I can't believe the clarity of your work. I finally started to say, okay, this is real. I'm really doing this. So I often tell people to just play with your friends as well so that you can get some feedback because then that helps you realize, okay, you know, I am really doing this. Right. About the fear of connecting with the dark, darker side, or I always say, I'm calling upon highly evolved beings of the light who serve the highest and best of all humanity and who serve the creator of all that is. Because Perfect. you want to make sure you're not getting beings that are just hanging out and forth. And, you know, you want to make sure you're connecting with highly evolved beings. And if, if you connect with something and it says, you know, go here, do this, um, it's usually not the high beings. They'll offer an overview. They'll offer a, a guidance. But, they're not usually that direct. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I'll even double check if I'm not sure. I, I feel a lot of love. I feel the love from the guides. So that's how I know I'm connecting with something high. And if I feel like something's a bit off, I'll just say, are you of the love and light of the creator? And they, they'll just disappear if they're not. Ah, see, I mean, I've heard from really respectable channelers the same thing. They'll, they'll, they'll challenge them in the name of Jesus or in the love of light, whatever's right. the highest to them. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. works every time. Right. Yeah. 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 Now I didn't, you didn't, I didn't ask you before. It, do you feel like channeling today? Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Is, do you have a choice of who, who you channel or, or who would you want to channel for this session? If we could ask some questions. 
Yeah, I was just going to ask who wants to come through, and I feel it's the Elohim who wants to come through. They're saying yes, and they're thanking you for, for receiving this message of this invitation, for they are delighted to have this opportunity to connect with all the magnificent souls who are going to be listening to this recording. So Brian, they are so delighted with this, with this connection that we're, we have. There's a great connection between you and I, a great energetic connection there that is allowing all of this to come forward. And they are deeply honored to be present to answer any questions. I am so honored to, to have you present and honored with what you've brought us and the creation that you brought us. Can you give us any guidance in this time right now for us to move and ascend spiritually and to help the earth? Beloveds, we would like you to know that the first piece about coming home and indeed ascension is coming home but first you must come home to yourself so many humans want to help others to be of service to others to rescue the world you could say without truly taking care of themselves and coming to the place of loving yourselves we want you to know that you can only love in the world to the extent which you are loving yourself. So if you are not healed enough to be in a, complete, a place of complete acceptance of the self and complete love of the self, then what you're going to create in your world is going to reflect that lack of love. So the first service is to the self. This one has heard many times that the word selfish, except for those who are particularly narcissistic or imbalanced, but for those who are of balance, the word selfish could be taken out of your language because you must be self-full before you are fully contributing to the world and bringing yourself into that place of ascension and that place of love. So the very first act of service is to be of service to the self, really becoming full within the self, coming to love and know who you are. And when more and more people are walking the earth from that place of inner grace, inner knowing, inner stillness, you do not project harm into the world. You do not project judgment into the world. You accept everything that is. And this level of acceptance is also key. We just love that you were talking about the trees because the trees accept, as you said, they accept whatever the outcome is. We will share with you this one, one time the trees asked her, what do you think love is? And this one responded, the acceptance of all that is. And they were surprised because accepting what is in your life experience is mastery. Once you get to that state where you are accepting, this one has gone through many trials and tribulations even in the last two years. And she just accepted it. She knew that it was somehow serving her highest good. She got to see that indeed that was the truth. And when she was empowered enough to make change, she did. And so this level of acceptance is also very important for you now. Anything that you don't accept, ask yourself, what is it within me that has trouble accepting this? Where is an underlying fear? Where is an underlying belief that doesn't allow me to accept this? Life is always showing you who you are. Your external world, life on the outside, is always showing you who you are on the inside. So come to know this, come to see this. This channel loves to use nature as her guide. So for example, if she's driving and she sees an eagle in a place where she would not typically see an eagle, she will instantly ask herself, what was I thinking in this moment? And because she is very self-aware, she will know what she was thinking in that moment. And she know, knows that this eagle is validating that as truth. Or there might be a butterfly come and land on a shrub beside you. Know that nature is speaking to you all the time and allow yourself to use this and integrate it. That is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I keep on the thought of unconditional love kept coming to me while you were speaking. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make that the next question. A lot of people watching and listening to this episode may have somebody that they get angry with or that they hate or despise. Maybe it's someone on TV or in their family or around them. How do we find love for those people? We would say to you, dear ones, it is as we have spoken. 
you must find the love within the self. The hatred is not for the other. The other is just a mirror for you to see the hatred within yourself. And many would say, I don't hate myself, but there is a piece in there somewhere where there's some kind of program, some wounding that has come to you. Perhaps someone who was parenting you or somewhere in your life experience, you were judged, you were put down, you, were, you weren't loved. And the only way for you to feel that you can rise above that is to judge others as being less than you because you weren't raised to feel that you were full and complete within yourself. And so whatever you are feeling and judging on the outside, this is a, a big piece about the mirror effect. This one has done a, a, a YouTube video about the mirror effect. It can be a hard concept to grasp, but once you get it, and once you are willing to really see that it always come back, comes back to the self, it's all about the wounding within the self, then you can use this to help you move through your life. And we want you to know this channel had a traumatic childhood. And her way was to rise above everything. She would disassociate. She would say, oh, that's okay. I'm just going to be the good person and do this. You can treat me like crap, but I'm going to be the good person and still be kind to you. She was stepping over all the pain, all the wounding, all the feelings that she was terrified to look at. And finally, she met a friend who really brought this to her attention. And her guides would connect with this friend and say, you need to tell Jane that she's avoiding again. And so this channel finally had the courage to really look in and be with her emotions. And we want you to know this because this will help. The first time she really did this, she felt literally like she was going to vomit, like she was ready to get the bucket because she really felt like she was going to be sick. It was so terrifying for her after all these years of avoiding to really go in and look. And what she discovered was the hardest part was having the courage to say, okay, bring it on. I'm ready to see it. Many things flashed before her. It was horrific. On the other side of it, she was a new person. And on the other side of the next one, she became lighter and lighter and lighter. And now she is who she is in this moment where she lives almost in complete peace and acceptance. So know, beloveds, that it's not necessarily easy to look in and see your own wounding, see your shadows. We have been afraid of the dark. You humans have been afraid of the dark. But it is only by walking into the darkness of your own shadows that you are going to move beyond that judgment, that hatred, and come to learn what unconditional love truly is. It is full acceptance of yourself, and therefore, you have full acceptance of everyone in your external experience. Know thyself is knowing everything that you are creating in your world. A lot of us watching this uh, are fearful of the world. They see the news. They worry about the environment, which they love. They worry about poverty and hunger and all these things come to their heart. Is there some way that I personally or anybody that's watching this can create a catalyst to allow all of us to go through that darkness, to, uh, to let go of the darkness within us? on a larger scale than individually, or is it only gonna happen individually? Do you understand my question? It, in the beginning, it happens individually. And then you have this theory that you call the hundredth monkey theory, where in time, enough of these individuals are coming together that builds a momentum that is strong enough that some, suddenly something just flips and that energy is there in the mass consciousness and everyone picks up on it it becomes now your new reality in the mass consciousness. So the more individuals who do this work of doing the internal healing, then the sooner you are going to make this flip. We would invite you to, part of it is disconnecting yourself from anything that generates fear for you. It can seem, pardon me, uncaring, unkind to turn your back, on what you see is all the trauma in the world. But we say to you, beloveds, you are not serving the world by diving into that trauma and contributing to it. 
you are serving the world. If you have to turn your back to see only light, to live in your own little bubble and to notice the beautiful flowers and just let yourself be in appreciation, live in your own small world for a while where everything is okay, that actually contributes more to serving those who are suffering in the trauma than to allow yourselves to get pulled into that when it's not your reality. So you're contributing to something that is not even yours that is pulling everyone down. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I, I have the fortunate and I'm honored to have the opportunity to sometimes offer group meditations where I can um, meditate with others. And oftentimes I, I don't know what the best way to do it. Do you have any advice as to facilitate the best group meditation for the best effect in helping the earth and humanity? First of all, beloved, we commend you for your contribution by doing these meditations and the number of people that you bring into these and that you are serving. We commend you for that. It's beautiful work. And we would like you to know that you can think about it less and just be in it more because you are, you are everything that you've come to be already. You are fully stepping into this higher frequency. You are in the fifth dimension. So you, you are living in this vibration and bringing this vibration into the world. So we would say to you to have just perhaps a, a, an overview of what you would like to offer. And as you go into the meditation and you are leading people in this meditation, allow your imagination to take you there as if you were doing a meditation and you were inviting your guides to come in and take you. Allow yourself to just be pulled into that and let the guides move through you and your own higher wisdom and the grace that you are move through you as you lead these meditations. It will all flow out of you intuitively, beloved. And we will tell you something else that this one does. For example, in preparing for this interview today, she said, I am statements. I am a clear and open channel of the love and light of all that is. When you use these words, then you are giving the invitation for that energy to flow through you. And this one hears an echo in her ears when she knows she is connected in that way. And so you may do this as well. As you know, intention is very powerful and you will flow. So we would invite you to be just in the flow, play with it. It will come very easily and freely. Allow the heart to guide as opposed to the mind. Thank you. And I, I definitely will be using that in all my future meditations. I'm very grateful for your advice. I can feel it that uh, it, I can feel the importance of it. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I'm a little bit starstruck <laughs> talking to the Elohim. So I don't um, oftentimes uh, I'll probably have some really good questions later on. Uh, Are there Elohim? Well, let me first ask. A lot of people are concerned or want to talk about past lives and times beyond their current incarnation. Is this important? Are these excursions important or should we release these memories and let them go? We would say the only time it serves you to be aware of your past lives is, is if it is impacting this current incarnation. This one likes to say as the veil is thinning as it is with you moving into higher frequency, then the lineality of time is shifting. This one describes it now more as a circle and you can look across the circle and see a past life. It has more influence. So when she's doing her work, often people are influenced by a past life not knowing that it's creating challenges for them in this lifetime. So in that instance, it's good to be aware of the past life, to see what that was and to just clear it and release it because it then clears this now moment, this experience in the now. As far as projecting into the future, it is worthy of you to do that if you are projecting a new earth that you would be like to be living on that's full of grace. Um, however, we would like to say, again, it's coming to know who you are. And there is this opportunity now to expand into a knowing that not to be pulled from the past, 
you have many experiences from the past, many highly evolved lifetimes. That's why the people who are on the earth at this time are here, because you've had many lifetimes going through experiences like this and being highly evolved. And okay. all of that is serving you, but don't let that limit you. Don't think you need to remember your lifetime in Lemuria so you know what to do now. Right. You have come to be who you've never been before. And humanity has not been at this frequency before that you are now in that you are evolving into so allow yourself to simply expand and say what is the great potential of who i am in this now moment and then tomorrow ask that same question again because you are changing every day and the more you let go of who you were even two days ago the more you allow yourself to be the expansiveness of who you are in this now moment that is wonderful uh, and thank you. So there's a lot of discussion uh, from different, and, in, and as you mentioned, this, this new earth uh, from multiple different channels about a new earth happening right now. And so are, a lot of people want to know, are we on the new earth now? Uh, did we miss it in 2012? Is there something we can do to bring about the new earth in our own lives? Beloveds, we would say the new earth comes not as pop, there's one, there's two, but individually and slowly in the beginning. Again, it's like you build the momentum. So we could say many of you are living in the new earth right now. Mm -hmm. Many of you are living in a state of peace and calm. When you look back 30 years ago, when this channel looks back on who she was and how frantic and emotional she was, she knows she's living a completely different experience. So many of you are living, and we want you to know this, in the new earth. So know this as you rise in frequency. Someone in 3D, for example, when you all lived in 3D, you could not see energy in the fifth dimension because you hadn't reached that yet. But when you're in the fifth dimension, you can still look down to where you were and see the energy of the 3D world. So you might think you're still in that world because you can look and see what's happening there, but many of you are And so you are living on a new earth. At some point, there will be some separation where some souls have made the choice that they are still living in the experience of the third dimensional reality and so in a sense, when you think of mitosis and those first two cells dividing and it pulls, 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 and then separates, at some point it will become like that, where there are two different realities existing. How that is going to unfold at this moment in time is not yet predictable because things are changing in every moment with, with what humans choose in every moment. Wow. Thank you so much. And I'm honored that you have spoken with us and answered my questions. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, Jane. I cannot tell you how much I appreciated the message that you gave. It resonates with me so much. And I hope to have you on again very soon. Thanks. Um, we, we, we've only talked for an hour, but I could, I could keep on asking you questions for, for even more. Uh, Conversations with a Tree by Jane Warren Campbell. You can get the paperback book there's a lot more than the Kindle copy. In the paperback book, she tells really about the message the trees give, and there's a lot more to it. Both are great, but I recommend the paperback book. That's a good place to go. And uh, so next time you guys see a tree, you need to be looking at that tree differently uh, and start listening. Start listening to the nature around you. And there's just so much that we learned from the Elohim and, and some other stuff in this. Thank you so much for coming with, uh, coming and joining the reality revolution. Thank you so much, Brian. It was really fun to be with you and just share. Well, th absolutely. And I will definitely have you on again soon. Welcome to the reality revolution. Blessings. Thank you. Well, welcome to the reality revolution. I'm just really excited today because this is the first day that my book is released. This is it, The Reality Revolution. Worked on this for a very long time.
many of the things that I discovered along the way, and I was excited to share it with everybody. Tell you a little bit about it. Uh, I'm like everybody else. I'm interacting in the world and, and starting to realize that my thoughts created reality. As I did this, I started to see some major shifts in my reality. I started to explore the idea of maneuvering through parallel realities. I'm your host, Brian Scott.